Okay, I've got all of the uh, submissions for homework three. Anybody else have a paper for homework three? Um, I've got homework four, and I'll give you that before we finish class today. It's due in a week at the beginning of class on Tuesday the 16th. It's having to do with flumes, which we're going to talk about today, and then also culverts. And uh, we'll introduce culverts today, but we actually won't get to the design of culverts and do a couple of in-class activities using the HY8 software on Thursday. So I'm going to show you at the end of our class today the link where you can download that free HY8 software. Uh, luckily, there's no activation required, and you don't have to have a school code to get it. It's just U.S. government software that's made freely available, so it's really easy to install. Um, one other thing that I wanted to show you is that uh, I know a lot of you are from outside the U.S., and I think that it might be useful if you consider whether to switch over the region and decimal settings for Windows, because uh, there are commas where there should be decimals, and there's decimals where there should be commas. For example, if a pipe size is uh, diameter is 1.00 feet, that's what it should say in an annotation. In some cases, it's saying 1 comma 00 feet. And so let me just show you, it's actually pretty easy to change that setting temporarily for submitting a homework or maybe for the entire time that you're in the U.S. If you just type in here, region, this worked, yeah, region, change the date, time, or number format then it'll say format, and so it may be in some other format here, but if you go to English United States, then that is going to uh, change the decimals so that, uh, let's see, I know that it, it was, yeah, here in the numbers, um, for the decimal symbol, it allows you to switch between having the uh, comma or the digit grouping, so you can make the adjustments so that instead of the periods, it's got the, uh, the decimals where they ought to be. So again, all you have to do is just type in region. And uh, when I helped another student with it earlier last week, all we had to do was just change it to say English United States and everything, like the commas were in the right place and there were uh, no more issues with it. So consider that. It's not a requirement, but it'll be a lot easier for the grader to interpret your spreadsheets if the uh, commas and decimals are in the format that he's accustomed to. We didn't get through a few of the pictures when we were talking about stormwater storage last time, and so I wanted to just briefly go through a few of these pictures and reintroduce these concepts to reinforce the ideas that are important, and then we're going to move on to flumes and culverts. Um, this is a diagram that shows conceptually your options for slowing down the water. And remember, the main idea is that when we have a runoff peak coming from an urban area, there's more runoff and it's arriving more quickly than it was before things were urbanized. And actually, I had the chance over this past weekend to do a little bit of consulting for an acquaintance of mine who uh, has a culvert. He and two other families have a culvert that they uh, put into place about six years ago, and it's always conveyed water under their road without any trouble, but there's been a lot of development in the watershed upstream of their culvert. Now, all the other families who've put houses don't have to cross this culvert to get to their house, but they've added additional roof area and driveways and concrete patios, and all of that additional impervious area means that the water levels during a storm are getting much, much higher upstream of that culvert, and it actually failed a couple of weeks ago, and he had to spend around $1,800 to replace it. So it's just an illustration of how the people who generate stormwater sometimes aren't the ones who suffer it. So the way to prevent problems like that is, uh, as often as possible, try and stop the water at its source. You can dispose of, lo of water locally. And it's interesting to think of water as something that has to be disposed of when so much of the country is in drought and they're critically short, short of water. And, California, Nevada, and the rest of the western United States. But here in the east, really sort of water is a waste product during big storms, and so we want to just get rid of it. And the ways that we illustrated that can be uh, um, increased and facilitated is through infiltration to the soil, percolation and pervious pavement are some of the ways to just get it down into the subsurface. And you'll remember that, for example, when we amend the soil, maybe if we have clay or rocky soils, 
If we dig that out and put in um, nice sandy soils and maybe a gravel bed underneath, that's a way of um, increasing the infiltration rate and enhancing local disposal of the water. Inlet control, I'll show you a picture of some parking area water storage, is just, uh, it's not so much getting it into the soil, but it's trying to hold on to it for just a few minutes to delay the peak before that it gets concentrated and into a network. The last thing that can be considered source control, where you're stopping the water before it's accumulating, is to put it in a pond there at the development in question. Now, these two options, inline detention and offline detention, are both where you're trying to hold on to the water temporarily as it makes its travel from where it's generated to its ultimate destination. So it's just trying to slow it down as the water is traveling from point A to point B. And you can do that by making meandering channels. You can put in um, underground vaults. And they do that in Chicago, as a matter of fact. They have a series of underground stormwater vaults that, during a wet weather event, just sort of hold on to the water because the pipes are so large as it's traveling from one place to another, it delays the travel. And then finally, if uh, the water is going to a, in a combined sewer to the wastewater treatment plant, then you'll have to put just a very large tank to hold on to it because a wastewater treatment plant can't go from a low flow rate to a high flow rate because there are actually uh, microorganisms um, that are breaking down the waste products in sewage that have to, uh, they can't react on, the, uh, on a dime. They, they have to grow over the course of many days to adjust to flow rates. And so we have to sort of make sure that the water coming into a treatment plant is doing so at a consistent flow rate. So reducing the runoff volume by lowering the C value, detaining the stormwater, trying to keep all the water from a development and then letting it into the inlet. We already looked at a video of pervious pavement and this is showing that uh, in um, pervious pavement what you're going for is cement covering the, um, the aggregate but very little of the sand that would normally fill in these voids. And so water has a flow path through the concrete. Um, here's a cutaway of what storage underneath a parking lot might look like if you don't have the option of pervious pavement. Because pervious pavement may not work very effectively in an environment with repeated freeze-thaw cycles. It, it wouldn't be as durable. And so actually under the new practice facility that recently opened and under the new engineering building, they are having some tanks like this where they can store the first inch of rainwater uh, during a storm. If it rains for an inch, the state mandates that there be enough storage on site to hold on to the runoff from the roof drain in underground tanks like this. And then when they fill up, the water will drain to the collection network. Um, here's a photo that shows inline detention. And this is just, um, it's sort of a hybrid between a tank, a pond, and a channel because what it would do is you would have water coming into this vault and then a couple of different overflows. You'd have an outlet very low that is only letting a certain amount of flow rate get through and then you'd also have a weir at the top so that the vault, the underground vault, isn't, um, isn't fully saturated so that when the water gets up to the weir, then it flows over the top at a higher rate. And so um, if you don't have any space next to a development that you can put a pond at the ground level, then burying that pond and making it a part of the transit from point A to point B for the water flow may be another way to accomplish the same thing. Now as a last ditch effort, you don't have any other choice but to build a flow equalization base in a wastewater treatment plant. And that's what WWTP stands for, is wastewater treatment plant. And a flow equalization basin is just a very large pond. And the purpose of it is to equalize two things, actually. Calling it just the flow equalization basin is a little bit of a misnomer because you're trying to even out peaks in both the flow rate and also what's called BOD. So that if normally, if you had a storm that puts a big peak in the flow rate like this, 
your flow equalization basin may be able to take the peak off that a little bit. And then actually the flow rate coming out of the flow equalization basin would be high for a long time and then finally start going down. Um, but remember that wastewater has pollutants in it, um, something that's called BOD, and that's biochemical oxygen demand. And uh, biochemical oxygen. The way a wastewater treatment plant works is that there are bugs there eating the waste that's in sewage water. And when you have a lot of rain, it dilutes that waste so that there isn't enough food for the bugs that are cleaning up the water. There's the, the concentration actually goes down temporarily. And so having a detention facility at the wastewater treatment plant allows you to uh, equalize the flow volumes and also the strength of the waste, the BOD. All right, so that sort of covers the stormwater management and we're going to move on to talking about weirs and uh, comparing them to um, what's called a partial flume. <coughs> You remember that last semester when we were in hydraulic engineering, we took a look at the flume and had a, an experiment with the broad crested weir. That's the wooden block that we set down in there. And we talked a lot about broad crested weirs and the way that they induce critical flow. Basically, when you have specific energy in the channel, if you put some obstruction in the channel that's too high, for the water to get over without changing alternate depths. Remember, let me just refresh your memory. We've got a channel, and water's flowing down the channel. At first, if we put in a small step like this, according to specific energy, what it's going to do is it's going to, if this is subcritical flow, its depth will just decrease slightly in response to that step up for subcritical flow. And so that if we make it a little bit taller, then the flow will go down a little bit more. But then eventually we can get to a height where there isn't enough energy for the flow to get over that obstruction without pooling. And so it pools a little bit upstream. It gets deeper here and then it continues to rise until there's finally enough energy to flow at the critical depth. Critical depth. And critical depth is the depth that has the least amount of energy required to convey the flow. It's sort of the most efficient flow point. So critical depth is uh, for a certain amount of specific energy, it's the least amount of specific energy for conveying the flow through the channel. Um, now, a broad crested weir is one of the ways of measuring flow, and it works by inducing critical flow, but it has a big disadvantage. And that is, if you think about this obstruction, the front face of that obstruction is going to be sort of a magnet for sedimentation and trash and debris, and so they require a lot of maintenance to be kept clean. Otherwise. Um, it can act actually as a, a dam if a bunch of branches and spare tires and garbage accumulates upstream of this broad crested weir. And so we put weirs like this in place to measure the flow rate. That, that's the purpose that it serves is a flow measuring device, but it requires a lot of maintenance. Um, we, can, um, we can try and avoid that by um, in a trapezoidal channel by making the contraction gradual. You know, it doesn't have to be all of a sudden a, a sharp front face. It could be sort of a gradual increase, but then that makes it much longer. And it's not always the case that we'll have a really long straight run that we can use for measuring the flow rate. Sometimes channels, natural channels especially, are curving a lot. Um, the other way around this, if we're trying to put in some sort of a choke to induce critical flow, because that's what this, this broad crested weir is a choke, remember? We're trying to choke the flow enough 
that it pools slightly and then critical flow goes over the obstacle. The other way that we can choke the flow is by contracting the channel by making it narrower in addition to possibly uh, putting a step up. And uh, the partial flume is a way of doing this that's going to avoid a lot of the sediment deposition that otherwise we might see. And also there's less head loss through there. You know, you're losing quite a bit of the energy because of this coefficient of discharge. Usually the coefficient of discharge, the typical values that we saw last semester when we were playing around with H values that varied was around 0 0.68, 0 0.69. And so, you know, you're losing around 30% of the energy because of this obstruction. But a flume is going to have less head loss than that and uh, it also is easier to maintain. And so let's look at a video that explains a little bit about flumes. The American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers 19th Historic Landmark designation is the Partial Measuring Flume. Since the beginning of irrigated agriculture, it has been important to accurately control and measure flows of irrigation water. Ralph Leroy Partial was born in Golden, Colorado in 1881. After high school, he enrolled at Colorado Agricultural College in Fort Collins now Colorado State University, and received a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil and Irrigation Engineering in 1904. In 1915, Partial joined the USDA as an irrigation engineer stationed in Fort Collins. In March 1928, he reported on an improved Venturi flume. It was unique, most importantly, by having a depression in the floor of the throat section. It required fewer stage readings to determine discharge and improved accuracy. In the days before pocket calculators and computers, partial statement that the flow equations for the flume are not particularly complicated, they can be readily solved by means of logarithms, was very important. This wooden flume installed in an irrigation canal near Rocky Ford, Colorado in 1924 may represent the first working installation. In December 1929, the Irrigation Hydraulics Committee of the American Society of Civil Engineers unanimously resolved that the flume should be named the Partial Measuring Flume. Partial Measuring Flumes have been designed and calibrated in a wide range of sizes. A Partial Measuring Flume with a one-inch throat can measure flows as low as two gallons per minute. This 30-foot flume operates in a canal in northern Colorado. A partial measuring flume with a 50-foot throat width has a capacity of more than 3,000 cubic feet per second. Partial measuring flumes have been constructed from wood, concrete blocks, poured in place concrete, steel and aluminum sheets, and fiberglass. They are being used worldwide not only for irrigation flow measurement but for industrial processes, municipal water supply, and wastewater treatment. This plaque commemorating the partial measuring flume was dedicated in 1985 and can be seen at the northeast corner of the Lorry Student Center on the Colorado State University campus in Fort Collins, the former site of the hydraulics laboratory where Partial conducted much of his research. All right. So one of the senses that you get from that video is that it's not easy to quantify flow rate. This is something that people, engineers, have been struggling with for a lot of years, and it was just maybe about 100 years ago that this partial flume was developed as a way of quantifying the flow rate. Uh, what you can see from this view is that it consists of 
There's a trapezoidal channel, and as it enters the flume, in the approach channel, the, uh, the flow is sort of smoothed out, and there's a stilling well to measure the depth. And then during the converging section, the channel is getting narrower, and simultaneous to that, the water is sort of going downhill. You don't get a sense of that in this view, but there's another view we'll look at in a second, that as it's converging, there's also a downward drop. And then in the throat section, there's a, a drop at a different angle, and then in the diverging section, it gets wider again. And so the depth is measured in two locations, and this shows you that it's in the converging section that you measure this H sub A depth, and then in the throat, you measure H sub B, and it's the ratio of those two depths that tells you a lot of information. It tells you that th this is going to cause a hydraulic jump because the, uh, the downward sloping channel is going to uh, cause supercritical flow that can't be supported after the diverging section. And so one of the ways this works is to force a hydraulic jump inside of the flume. And you look at the ratio of the two depths to know if the hydraulic jump is submerged underwater or if it's free flowing. And there's a little correction factor we have to go through if it's submerged. And then also you can, um, based on calibration equations that are provided by manufacturers or published in textbooks, just by the width of the channel and then the two depths that are given, that's how you plug it into empirical equations and know what the flow rate is. Uh, here's a look at some of these different empirical equations, and it has a throat width, and you'll notice that in, in some simple cases, it's just as easy as taking the upstream measurement to some power, exponential power, to find the flow rate. Um, but then it gets a lot more complicated depending on if the width is variable. And you can see here that anywhere between 30 centimeters and 2.4 meters that the uh, the equation has an exponent to an exponent power. And that's the example we're going to work. We're going to work an example of a, uh, a flume that is 0.61 meters in width. Um, there's a really wide range in flow rates that these flumes can be used to quantify, and that's part of what makes them so useful is that during dry seasons, maybe there will just be a trickle of water coming out of a watershed, and then when it rains, the flow rate can increase by 10,000 or 100,000 times. And so having a wide range of flow measuring capacity like this flume can be made to have is really useful. So here's the process that you have to go through. Like I mentioned, there's a hydraulic jump inside of the flume. And a hydraulic jump can be submerged under the uh, water that's downstream. And you know whether it's submerged by looking at the ratio of these two depths. And so one of the first considerations is deciding if the hydraulic jump is submerged and um, if the H sub B to H A ratio exceeds what's shown here, then it is submerged and the correction process is a little bit more complicated. Um, here's a, an example of a flume that has a width of 0.3 meters, what correction factor you have to apply based on how submerged the hydraulic jump is. Um, so if we have an HB to HA, and you find out what is the percent submergence for a certain head reading, you'll go over to the percent submergence and then down, and that tells you what the correction that has to be applied is. And this is for a, a 0.3 meter flume. Um, if you have a curve for a different width, then you can just go through this simple process of finding out what's the upper head and what's the percent submergence. Uh, if you don't have a figure like this for a different width, here are some correction factors that let you use this figure for other widths. So you can see how this figure is only for W equals 0.3. But we can use this figure with a 0.61 meter width, for example, by going through this process and finding the correction and then multiplying the correction that this says by a correction factor. And then here's the list, the table of correction factors. We'll go through an example that illustrates the process from beginning to end. But I just wanted to give you an overview of that. Let's say that we're interested in a flume that has a width of 0.6 meters. And um, the depth in the converging section is measured for a certain flow rate to be 
45 centimeters, and then the depth in the throat section is measured to be 39 centimeters. First of all, we're going to find out if the jump is submerged, because whether it is tells us whether we have to go through a more detailed correction process. And then we're going to find out what's the flow rate through the flume. Uh, this example is very similar to one of the homework problems, actually two of the homework problems, two of the four. So once we go through this example, I think you'll be in a good position to begin on the homework that's due a week from today. Um, so we start off with W equals 0 0.61 meters. H sub A, which is the converging section depth, is 0 0.45 meters. And H B, which is the throat depth, is 0 0.39 meters. How to keep track which is A and which is B? Well, A is the upstream measurement. B is the downstream measurement. And in the flume, you measure the converging section, and then you measure the throat. So we want to check the ratio HB to HA to find out submergence. So our submergence check, if we have 0.39 divided by 0.45, that gives us 0 0.867. And that is greater than our limit of 0.7. If we go back to the previous slide, you can see that the limit is 0.7. If H sub B to H A is any larger of 0.7, then that means that the hydraulic jump is submerged. So we have to go through the correction process. So yes, the hydraulic jump is submerged. We must apply correction factor. To the equation. So we can't just plug it into this equation and be done. That will be one of the steps that we do, but it won't be the only one. All right. So uh, let's take a look at this flow rate equation that we've got. This is obviously empirical. This is not the result of Bernoulli's equation. This uh, is not a derivation of Manning's equation. It's just strictly based on observation that they came up with uh, each of these factors here. And so in an empirical equation, um, it's only valid for the certain flume width in question uh, or a range of flumes that, flume widths that is calibrated for. Uh, in this case, we have 0.372 times W to the 3.281 times HA and that's to the power of 1.570 times W to the 0 0.026 power. Now our width is 0.61. We know HA, uh, HB doesn't formulate into this equation. Let's substitute in the values that we know. 0 0.372 times 0 0.61 meters. And then that's going to be times 0.3, uh, 3.281 times HA, which is 0.45 meters. And then that's 1.570 times W, which is 0.61 meters. And then just the W is to the power of 0 0.026. Why don't you get practice punching that into your calculator? It's an exponent with an exponent see what you get is the flow rate for this flume.
Did anybody else get the same flow rate as me, 0.4151 cubic meters per second? Okay, it's always, I'm always relieved when somebody else gets the same one. That's only the flow rate, though, if there wasn't a submerged hydraulic jump. Because there is a submerged hydraulic jump, that's causing some energy losses inside of the, uh, inside of the flume. And so we have to go through the correction process to find out what actually is the flow rate by, by finding the correction factor and the correction amount. Um, our flume width here is 0.61 meters. So I'm going to go to the previous slide here. I'm going to use this same figure here for a, a width of 0.3 meters. So I'm going to use this figure and then I have to apply the correction factor of 1.8 to whatever value I get. Because my flume is bigger, so there's going to be more of a correction factor required. So my correction factor is 1.8. So I'm going to write here on the board that my correction factor is 1.8. And um, from the figure, I have my HB to HA, HB to HA, remember, was 0 0.867. So that is 87%. So I'm going to start off with my H sub A. Here is the value of uh, 0.45 on the vertical axis. Now you'll notice that this is not a uh, linear scale. It looks like this is a logarithmic scale on the vertical axis. And so I have to be a little bit strategic in where I say 0.45 is. So here's 0.45 and I go over until I intercept the curve that's associated with 87%. So I'm going over, looking for 87%. It's between the uh, 86 and 88. So here, here it is, 87%. And then down. And again, this is also a logarithmic scale on the horizontal axis, so it makes it a little bit tricky to read that. Um, halfway, 0 0.05 would be a little bit further to the right. If you look at how things work, it's not right in the middle for 0.45. So where this ends up being, I read that off of the scale as the, uh, the correction is 0 0.044 cubic meters per second. That would be the correction that has to be applied if the throat width was 0.3 as the figure, but with the figure goes along with. But I have to multiply, what's that? Let's see, did I do it on the wrong one? Let's see. Now here's the curve to 88. Look, here's the 88 line. Okay. And so it's above that, it's between the 88 and here's the 86 line. Yeah, so it's in the right spot. I'm glad you asked, though, if you had any uncertainty. Okay, so the delta Q is going to be 1.8, which is my correction factor, times 0 0.044 cubic meters per second. And that is 0 0.092, uh, uh, 9.0. 792 cubic meters per second. So the final answer, this was what I got if it was free flowing, but now I have to subtract that amount because that represents energy loss due to the hydraulic jump being submerged. So the actual Q value is 0.4151 minus 0 0.0792, and so that is 0 0.3359 cubic meters per second. So this is our final answer to what's the flow rate through the flume? It's because this figure is supposed to only be used for a partial flume that has a throat width of 0.3 meters. 
but I can use this figure for a different flume width if I take the answer that it gives me and multiply by a correction factor. So um, if I had this figure for the throat width of 0.61, then I wouldn't have to use the correction factor. But it's kind of like if you were using a, uh, um, if you had a speedometer for your car and you go up to Canada, like if your speedometer didn't say kilometers per hour, then you'd have to think in your mind, well, I've got to multiply by the conversion factor from miles per hour to kilometers per hour. Here, this figure and this scale is for a throat width of 0.3, but our flume is 0.61, so we have to adjust its answer by this correction factor. Any other answer? Any other questions about the uh, flume question? In the homework that I'm giving you today, I just ask you to go through the, uh, the process of calculating the flow rate for a certain flume. And then in the second question, I ask you to, uh, to sort of uh, design a flume and then ask you what would happen under a certain situation for the flume that you design. Designing a flume really is just a matter of looking at the range of flow rates that it's valid for. So designing a flume means you find out what flow rate range are you going to be in and then picking the throat width. You're saying, well, if my flow range is going to be in this zone, maybe I'll choose 23 centimeter throat width. And then just evaluating how does that flume behave for the flow rate that you actually will have. All right. Now we're going to talk about culverts today. And just to get us out of the mode of me lecturing and you listening, I wanted to give you this critical thinking form. This asks a couple of questions just so that you can um, sort of try and figure things out on your own about culverts, and then we'll talk about it together. I ask a driving question, that is, how big should a culvert be to carry a certain flow rate? Now, you don't know right now how big the culvert has to be, but you're going to be able to figure that out after you ask a couple of, after you go through and answer a few what are called guiding questions. So the main driving question is, how big should a culvert be if it must convey a flow rate of 20 cubic meters per second under a two-lane asphalt paved roadway? You don't know that yet, but you can do the supporting questions, and it's a front and the back here. I'm going to give you some homework points for completing this in class today. It's counting as an assignment question. So it gives you some incentive to do a good sketch and to think a little bit about each of the questions here. So we'll take... Uh, a few minutes for you to work on the front and the back, and then I'll ask you to work with a partner and discuss what you got and their answers. But for now, just think individually about the questions that are asked on the page. Stay sitting with your group. I just want to show you a couple of pictures and say a few things that maybe will help you with your answers. So just uh, look at the screen briefly. Um, culverts are used to pass water under a road or a highway. It's cheaper than a bridge, and so it's far more common to put a culvert in. Uh, the flow rate depends on a lot of things. I'm sure you've identified many of these things that guides the flow rate. I won't talk about them in detail, but here's a box culvert. This box culvert has what's called four barrels. Each of these openings that water goes through is called a barrel. And here is a wing wall. The purpose of the wing wall is to guide flow and also to help prevent sedimentation uh, from being scoured. You don't want the water that's going through the culvert, it's moving very fast, to erode the soil. And so this sort of smooths the transition into the culvert. Here's a picture of a box culvert. Uh, some culverts at the bottom are unlined. And this is showing that the concrete is on the side and the top, but the bottom is just a natural channel in this instance. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, here is a galvanized steel pipe culvert. Um, 
So it can be any conduit that passes water under a road. And they're used because they're cheaper than bridges. And it's usually for a lower flow rate than a bridge. You, you know, here's the London River, uh, the, Tam the Thames. You wouldn't have a culvert for the Thames. It's too big. So there's an upper limit to what a culvert can pass. Um, all right, so that's all I wanted to show you for now. Keep working on those questions with your part group partners. Okay, I want to show you a few other things about culverts before we run out of uh, time for class today. The way that a culvert is sized is that, first of all, you go through a hydrologic process to find out what the flow rate is going to be. And then you look at the hydraulic factors of the culvert that determines how large it has to be. Um, here are some diagrams that just show the different inlet configurations. And each one of these inlet configurations can have an influence on how much energy is lost as the water gets into the culvert. And then, of course, energy loss is occurring inside the culvert as well. And that can be a function of the material that the culvert is being used. Uh, it can be the, um, the size of the culvert has an influence on the energy loss, the flow rate, the slope. Um, culverts can be broken down into their behavior is broken down into inlet control and outlet control. And inlet control, as you can see from each of these diagrams, is when Generally speaking, how much water gets through the culvert is uh, governed by the size of the opening. Like the barrel itself could carry a lot more flow, but the size of the opening is limiting how much actually gets through the culvert. And this is pretty common for inlet control to be what governs. Outlet control means that it's not the opening of the culvert that's uh, slowing down the flow so much as actually the contact with the pipe itself. And uh, the calculations that you go through for outlet control, if you do it the traditional way, is to use what are called nomographs, which is where you'd find the diameter of the culvert and you'd uh, pass it through the uh, discharge and then that would tell you how large the culvert needs to be and different inlet configurations, how uh, how that would maybe change the required size of the culvert. And if it's sized wrong, if you get the, the culvert too small, it can really cause a lot of damage. Here is a sequence of photos that shows a road that was totally collapsed because the flow went around the side of a culvert instead of through it. And so uh, it scoured out all of the material that was placed around the side of the culvert. So the stakes are pretty high. If you, if you missize the culvert and the headwater gets too high, that creates a pressure and it will scour away the fill material. Uh, here's a picture of some culverts that I, I took these photos in the UAE, which is a dry uh, desert country. But still, when it rains and rains very hard, the culverts has to be large enough to convey that big rush of uh, stormwater as it comes through. Here along the face of the culverts, they had a wire mesh to keep this gravel and um, heavy, heavy rocks in place. Gives you an idea of how large it is. Here's the software you should download. Uh, just if you Google HY8 download, then you'll come right to the page. Actually, I have the link here to version 7.2, but I think now the version is 7.3. If you don't install it on your computer, then we can just use the uh, tablet computers. But um, in class on Thursday, we're going to take a look at an example that will allow you to very quickly identify whether the culvert is inlet or outlet controlled and how the hydraulics are behaving under a certain flow rate. That's it for today. Remember that uh, your homework assignment is due a week from today. I'll hand that out as you're leaving. and. Uh, Let's go to the announcement slide here. All right. We will talk more about culverts when we get together on Thursday.